Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland, and in this episode, we'll be reviewing the V3 motion platform from the guys at Next Level Racing. Can such a small package deliver a truly immersive driving experience? <laughs> well, we're going to put this 2DOF unit through the SRG review process and find out. So, let's get to it. All right, so now we're going to take a closer look at this NLR V3 unit and talk about a few things. Now, first thing that, that strikes me, because it's got the most contrast on this unit, is the spring here, and we have some, some eye bolts here, or rather some rod ends, and you can see they move so that when these levers coming off this motor is moving the top part of this platform, that there does, nothing binds up. It's able to move freely. And we also have this big spring here. Now, the spring is actually a dampening unit here. So when it pushes up, it pulls against the spring. And when it pushes down, obviously, the spring is pushing back up. So that gives a nice dampening effect, which I'm sure smooths, smooths things out when we're actually using this unit. Now, we also have a lever here. And I don't know how well that's going to show up, but there's, a, there's kind of an oblong slot in it. And that lever goes back and connects to what they tell me is a planetary gear in here that is attached to the front of these servo motors, these long servo motors that are inside of here. And of course, that's what's making these things move. So pretty simple, but I'm sure as far as looks, how this is designed, but yeah, I'm sure there was a lot of trial and error that, and testing that had to go in to, to get this dialed in, get the right spring rates and things like that. So yeah, and getting the right gearing coming off the servo motors to make things work like they should. Right. So this top platform, obviously, this is where we're going to be mounting our seat. It's got this nice NLR graphic up here. You know, I think I can tilt this forward a little bit so you can get a better look at it. There it is. This whole unit weighs 55 pounds, so that's why I have it on this table so I can move it around to show things a little bit easier. So yeah, a nice big thick, it's like three and a half mil steel on these rails here. And the dimensions on this, as far as seat mounting, is going to be, and there's, as you can see, there's actually a slot back here, and there's a smaller slot up front here. But if I take the centers off of that, it's about, let's see, 275 millimeters. Right. So, and that comes out to about, what is that, 10 and 10, 7 eighths? That's what it looks like. Maybe a little less. So 10 and 7 eighths. And across, we have centers of... 355, it looks like, millimeters for these holes here. I'm going to check the back. I'm sure they're the same, and they are. Right, so 355 millimeters going this way. So you, when we're going to mount our seats, this is something we're going to have to consider. Are they going to fit these holes? And I guarantee you, unless you have their seat, it's not going to fit. There's going to, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to put some spacers in, maybe make some kind of a bracket to adapt to it. And I think I'm probably going to get away with my seat using the Sparco side brackets and maybe space it out a little bit from the seat to match up to these holes. But we'll see when we get there. Right. Anything else I want to measure here? I think that's the important part. Now, right underneath the top of this platform, and you're not going to be able to see this because it's tucked underneath these lips here. And it's very hard to see. But, yeah, there's actually a universal joint right in there. You see where that piece of, there's three bolts, you see, I don't know if you can see, there's three bolts, and then right under that middle bolt, that's where the, the pivot point is, and it's a, kind of like a universal looking joint, which you might imagine, because it has to be able to tilt this way for roll, and then we got up and down well, for the pitch, and that's the movement range of this unit, so we got two axes of movement, right, everything is very heavy duty, Again, this is like 300, three and a half millimeter thick as far as all the rails here. I measured those out. So very heavy duty unit. When you have this in hand, and it's, it's hard to tell from pictures or video what something feels like and, and really, you know, what it looks like until you have it in hand. And yeah, as soon as you get it, you know, this is one big sturdy unit. Now, max capacity for this is 285 pounds or 130 kilos. So that's a lot of weight. And of course, that includes the seat. So that is a lot of weight that this thing can handle. And yeah, that's, like I said, I was a little surprised it could handle that much. And I, I suppose it can because there's really short distances between the motor and the actuators here, which is you know, a little different than, say, a seat mover that has the SCN actuators attached to a bracket that you put the seat on. 
and they have a, a longer reach to them. So anyway, good weight limit on this, I think. I, I would not hesitate to recommend somebody who is a heavier person would, would want to get something like this, I think, and, and probably never have a problem. All right, so let's go around to the front here. Obviously, we got a power button here, a little rocker switch. We've got some LEDs down here on the bottom that will give us power indication and movement indication, it looks like, because there's a little up and down pointer on top of these LEDs. So I imagine that means, yeah, when it's going up, one lights, when it goes down, the other one. But we'll see that once we get it operating. The top here, we can see there's a fan. And that fan, obviously, is going to be cooling the electronics in here. I imagine there's a PCB in here and maybe some power transistors or power unit in here somewhere. But we'll, we'll take a look at that when we get to it. Right, moving right along. We'll just cruise over to the side here. There we go. And not a lot to see here, obviously. It's just the, the side of the actuators. But we do have three holes here. And these holes are M8 threads. And they actually give you, in the kit, six of these M8 socket head cap bolts. And these are 20 millimeter threads on here. So, of course, they'll just go ahead and screw in there to mount our side brackets on. And now we're at the side, we might as well show you what those look like. And these are actually very nice. I like these. They are powder coated steel, it looks like to me, from the feel of it. And they've got a nice graphic in here. It looks like it's water jet cut or laser cut for the lettering. Very cool looking. And we have the corresponding three, actually four holes on the top of this. So we can actually put this on here. Let me remove, remove my bolt here. We can actually attach this to the side to whichever three of these that we want to. It looks like. Let's see. Maybe not. No. Yeah, it'll fit on those three with this hole hanging off. But if I try to slide it back to the third hole, it doesn't. It, we got yeah, the back one, this one here, and this one here looks like it lines up but the middle one is not lined up with this one. So you can see there is a pattern here the way they've done this. Now if I reverse this and put it on the other side and try to go back, it's probably the same issue. Yep, so it really doesn't change. Yeah, so really there's only one way to mount these and that's gonna be towards the front of this, it looks like, of the chassis itself. So that'll line up and we'll have this point, more of it pointing out toward the front. So anyway, Inside, we've got this little piece of plastic that's riveted in, and of course, that's providing the colors for our lettering. Very nicely done. You know, when you get this out of the box, it, this is like top, top flight production here. This is all professionally done, commercially done uh, work here. It's, it's all, there's, there's no powder coating misses where there, you can see some silver through the powder coating, things like that. And I always look for things like that when I'm looking at something just to see how, you know, what kind of quality standards are are being held to here and it looks like this is really top notch it's right up there with you know the commercial stuff that you see now it's much heavier dirtier so don't don't think i think i'm relating thrustmaster and logitech to this i'm just talking about the process and the manufacturing processes are at that kind of level materials here used are just exceptional of course it's all heavy duty steel you know, plate everywhere maybe some aluminums in other places but anyway yeah the side plates I'm not going to use these. I'm going to have to come up with another mounting solution because the bottom of these side plates, and we'll actually go ahead and put this here. You guys can see that, sort of, kind of. And I'm going to measure the holes we have underneath here. And from center to center to the extreme here, we've got 420 millimeters. And we also have another hole over here at 210 millimeter mark. So. That's not where my problem is. Once I mount this to the side here, let me spin this around so you can see what it's doing. And actually it'll be mounted down this way, right? But I'm just gonna flip it up here so you can see what I'm talking about. If we mount this to the side, of course, it's gonna kick the mounting point from here to here, which is, let's see if I'm long enough here to measure that. The mounting points are about 460 millimeters across this is to, and this was going to kick it out, as you can see, because of the bend here. Another, yeah, it's going to kick it out at least another 20, 30 millimeters. So it's, when I put both of these on, it's going to be too wide for the rig that I'm going to put this on. And that's just, you know, I, I was not you know, expecting it to fit because nothing seems to ever fit anyway. You have to do some kind of modding or, or put some spacers in or something to make this stuff work. Anyway, put this back over here. 
So anyway, that's a, a consideration when you're actually having to mount this, but yeah, we can always find a solution. Now, what struck me also, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this, the way this is shaped, there's a very cool shape on this. It reminds me of the Star Wars battle cruiser kind of, you know, the way those things are shaped. And then of course we got the, the superstructure sitting on top of it, but it's kind of flat here obviously. But that's just, I don't know, it just kind of struck me that yeah, it kind of looks like the, the rear of those when you see that in the movies anyway. <laughs> so what else we got here to look at? All right, we can see back here, we've actually got some access doors and I can see down in here, you're not gonna be able to see this, but there's a motor down here and this motor actually runs the length up to the front to where obviously we saw before where the lever attached to the planetary gear is coming out. So we've got some covers here. It looks like there's some hex screws here and we're probably gonna be able to pull these off. I don't see any warranty stickers on avoid the warranty if you uh, take these off. So we might take those off and take a peek in there in the look inside segment. And yeah, we'll just see how that works out. Now, of course, the other side is gonna be the exact same as we've seen already with the holes, right? So not much else to see there. And let me go ahead and put this off to the side because I want to grab this real quick. Get this out of the way. I don't want to scratch up my finish by setting this thing down on a bolt. Let me turn this back around. I don't know what I want to do here. All right, let me grab this. Kind of walk it a little bit. And we'll put her back down, upside down. Ah, there we go. All right. Now, first thing we'll notice is there's some doors here with some fans in them. How about that? So these are larger fans, much larger fans than that little fan on the front. And I can also see back here, I don't know how well you guys can see this. I'll try to tilt it up so you can see. Looks like we have something that may probably a mean well power supply in here, one of those self-contained switching power units. But we'll actually see if we can take one of these doors off without messing up my warranty. <laughs> and just take a peek in there. We might even get a better look at the motors themselves because they're, let's see if I can see in there. I can always see them in there. They're running, again, the length of this whole chassis here. So yeah, there's something we can look at, but most of this stuff, you see all these, these are not screws. These are actually rivets everywhere. And yeah, to get this off, you'd have to drill the rivets out and then re-rivet it. So yeah, we're not gonna mess with that. But I do see we have some hex screws along here, the front here. And I'm just trying to think of where I'm, I'm going to be able to access this so we can get a peek inside at, at how some of the stuff is working. But anyway, we'll get to that in the look inside segment. So not much else to see here. Anything else I need to tell you about? Oh, yeah. There's actually, the reason I'm flopping this around and the, and the platform down here is not never moving. You never see it move. Is there's actually a braking system in this unit, right? It has a a motor brake, kind of a, a magnetic motor brake. So if there's no current to the motor or whatever the, the gearing system is here, then these magnets will engage and keep anything from moving, which is a good thing because when you're getting in and out of the seat, you don't want it moving around on you, even when it's off. Now, when I had my sim experience, just as an example, uh, stage four rig, that if I had all the power off to that rig, if you tried to, to get, sit in the seat, the, the actuators would move. So you couldn't, you couldn't really get in the seat until you put power to it then the actuators would, would come on and, and the motors would engage and it wouldn't move anymore when you, so you can get in and out of the seat, which is neat that they actually added this feature. And that's why I'm, I'm saying, I mean, talking about it, that, yeah, even with the power not applied to this, yeah, this thing is not moving. So that's great for, you know, just jumping in and testing things real quick when you don't want the, the unit activated. Right. Anything else? Yeah, it's pretty simple what we're seeing here. It's not much to see once we understand what's going on with the dampening, of the, the spring dampening and all that stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I like what I see so far. I really do. It's a very nicely done unit, very professionally done. Yeah, I think everybody or anybody that had this on their rig would be proud to have it because it just looks good. All right, so what we'll do next, I guess, is see what we can find out as far as what's inside of here in the look inside segment. Okay, we've got the front cover off and just the power cover here, or rather it says where the power button is, rather, power switch. And yeah, easiest way to get to see what's going on here, I think, without avoiding my warranty. And first off, you can see that there's this big aluminum heat sink in here. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and zoom in. But first I wanted to, once I got this open, I was able to see that the, this electronics board, this PCB board here, is actually manufactured by Motion Systems in Europe. And Motion Systems, if you don't know who they are, are a, prominent industry manufacturer 
uh, that manufactures motion platforms all the way up to this one. They actually manufacture this one. They call this, and I'll show you a shot of it here, an HS-203 unit. And it's, was, I imagine they manufactured it for next level racing because they're the only ones I can tell that are actually distributing this unit. So, yeah, again, this makes sense to me because I'm, I'm from the outside, I was looking at it and making comments that, wow, this is really a, a superbly manufactured piece of gear here. And now that all makes sense to me because now I know who's doing the manufacturing. So, yeah, the family lineage here on this unit is very, very good because they make systems all the way up to this PS6TM2500 unit, which is a 56,000 euro 2500 kilogram payload capable six DOF motion system. So yeah, this, this is the little guy here, but it definitely has some great lineage. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is go ahead and try to zoom in a little bit. And you can see the motors on each side, or at least the ends of the motors on each side here. And the motor shaft ends right up in here. And back in the back, you can see there's where this armature is, where we saw before. Let's see if you can see it there in the shot or not. But anyway, that's connected to the planetary gear that's in front of the motor, right? And only thing I can, on these armatures, I can see these white plates in here. And the only thing I can guess at those are some kind of positioning, you know, help these position sensors understand what the position of this armature is when the motor is m moving while we're actually using this unit, right? So not much else I can see here. Now, of course, the, one of the prominent things here is this huge aluminum heat sink here. And of course, that's attached to the power transistors that are actually attached to this PCB board itself. And that's really nice to see such a huge aluminum heat sink because that's gonna provide some really good cooling properties, I think. And you can see up here the fan, that's actually a 50, I think 53 millimeter or 50 millimeter, whatever that family is of like computer case fans. So that's directly blowing down on this heat sink. So that's a very, I like that configuration. It really makes sense. It's logical and I'm sure it's very effective and efficient. Now, obviously this is the power controller circuits for these motors. And you can see we've got these huge resistors over here, two over here and two over here for this motor and for this motor over here, I'm assuming. Right. Uh, other than that, it's yeah, a very neatly done PCB board. Not much else to see here. And we've also got this little plastic thing here, and that's the lights that give us the indicators for power and the up and down movement of both sides of this unit when it's actually working. Yeah, but not much else to see as you can as, as you can see here. It's uh, yeah. So I had to open it up and see what was going on, and, and we found out a lot of information just by doing that. And I'm sure there's no harm done here. I'm just going to put that plate right back on. And yeah, that's really all we can see at this point. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to cut this segment or this, or, you know, this little clip here, and I'm going to turn it over and see if we can take a look at the motors themselves on the back part and on the bottom part under here. There's some access hatches underneath here on the bottom. So we'll take a look at that when we get back. All right, guys, it's going to be a quick follow-up to the look inside. I told you I was going to go to the back and see if we could take some of these other ports off or access panels, and I did. I just took this one off because the other one's exactly the same thing. All you can really see is the back of the servo motor here, and there's a warranty void if removed sticker on the back of the motor actually here. So there must be some kind of a maybe an adjustment access in here. And, of course, we just got a couple of fans on top, and really it's pretty much just hollow inside of here. It's got some wires running around the perimeter here that go into a a breakout board up here. It's not even a circuit board, it's just a breakout board. So really not much to see here. One thing I, I, I am noticing is, yeah, to pull this power supply out, I'm not sure how you're gonna do that without taking this whole casement off here. So yeah, it seems to be pretty involved to do any kind of maintenance on this thing. And they probably built it that way on purpose. So anyway, enough of that. What we'll do next is get to the mounting and installation part of this review and see how we're gonna mount it on the rig. We are now ready to get this next level racing V3 motion platform mounted to our SimLabs GT1 Evo cockpit. Now, th I, there's a lot of th things you gotta consider when you're mounting something like this. It's a very heavy piece. You gotta make sure it's supported properly. And not only that, but it's gonna be moving and it's gonna have a lot of torque on this 
piece of the frame here as it moves. And of course, that torque is going to translate into a, a reaction into the chassis of this unit. So we got to make sure that we bolt this thing down and have a good solid platform to mount it to. I'm not using the side pieces that come with it because I just can't use those brackets. It makes it too high and it's too wide and some other things. So we're just not going to use the brackets, although I wish I could because they are, they're pretty cool looking brackets. They got good graphics on it. But anyway, well, it is what it is and we just have to use it this way. And if you can see what I have here, let me twist, uh, turn this around here where is I have four of these gusseted corner brackets, inside corner brackets that I'm going to be using to mount this with. Very strong brackets and I was able to take my ratchet over here and get these torqued down really well here. So yeah, these things are, are really, really tight, really solid and I might snug them up again once I have the bolts down the bottom of the 8020. I don't know. We'll just have to see how that goes. You can see I've got some blue painter's tape on here where I've been test fitting this on the rig. And yeah, it's all the way down in the groove. You can see how much groove is sticking up here. See how much slot is on the top part because I'm trying to lower these brackets as much as possible, which of course in, in relation to this, it makes it sit a little bit lower, right? If I had it down further, then it would kick it up higher. I'm trying to keep this as low as possible in the rig itself. So when I mount my seat on here, I don't have some weird tall seat and I, and I can't get the steering wheel to adjust properly to get a, a decent ergonomic racing position. So it's, again, there's a lot of consideration that goes into mounting this or any seat for that matter, but especially this because, you know, you've got all these torque forces that are going to be twisting and moving around against the frame itself. And these are the points. I might actually put a third one in here. I don't know yet. After I get the seat on and I'm testing it, moving it, I'm going to be watching it very closely. And if there's any movement at all I can detect, then I'll go ahead and put a third bracket in there. Not a big deal. Just put another one in there and attach it to the frame. But I got a feeling this is like rock solid. I mean, there's no way this is not budging at all. They have some really nice solid mounting points here. So I think this is going to do it. So I'm going to take this painter's tape off and I'm going to be using these. These are some spacers that I have spacer material, if you will. They come in these long looking fork things and you can snap them off. And I've actually trimmed these down to size. So these will actually sit like this underneath. And then I'll have the bolt down in the middle there. Or they can sit like this, however you want to do it. Really, it's not that important which way it goes. But I've actually trimmed them down so they won't be sticking out past the bracket once it's sitting on top of the profiles. Right. So that's about it as far as what I've come up with and how I'm going to be installing this. So now we got to do is take this heavy piece of kit, <laughs> 55 pounds of it, and very gently and carefully place it on these pieces that I already know where, the, where it's going to be sitting. So I can put these pieces down and then sit it on top after I take this painter's tape off. And then we'll be securing it with the regular galvanized socket head cap bolts. And these are M8s. And I believe these are like 15 mil long, which is just enough to go through there and then get the nut that's already sitting in the profile. But you'll see that once I go over there and place this where it needs to be. So we'll get to that next. All right, we've got the platform securely mounted to our SimLabs GT1 Evo rig. And it looks like these two corner brackets on each side are gonna do the job. At least that's what it looks like so far. And it's very, very tight. I can't get any movement at all out of it. So I think that is exactly what the doctor ordered right here. And we'll walk around the back side. And you really can't tell from this shot, but there's plenty of room underneath so that the fans can get plenty of air to cool the servo motors that are running everything. Walk around here, see the other brackets. And the seat is just sitting on top of the platform. I do not have that bolted in yet, so, but I can't help myself. I gotta try to see how this thing looks as far as the ergonomics, because I was really concerned about the height of this unit mounted to this cockpit. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna walk over, let me put this one up, and walk over to the rig, and very carefully get in this seat and try not to make anything go crazy. Let me pull my little radio out here. Make sure that's not stuck on anything. My wire's going everywhere. That's great. There we go. Okay, now we're ready. All right, so very gently. There we go. Okay, 
Nothing went flying, so that's great. Oh yeah, this is, uh, this is actually exceeding my expectations. I think I've got this, this seat is definitely low enough to where I'll be able to, in fact, I might even have to lower this, this down, I'm thinking. Yeah, this platform for the wheelbase here, which is a very stiff unit in its own right, is going to have to be lowered a little bit for the ergonomics to be right. But yeah, I'm real happy the way this is, this is lining up now, so this is great. Now all we got to do is get the rest of the hardware on the cockpit and see how everything works together. So we'll get to that segment next. So this is the final result of getting the seat brackets actually bolted to the top of the V3 platform. And I was lucky here that I didn't have to fabricate any kind of aluminum plates or anything to make this work because a lot of times that's been the case where I usually are drill holes in the existing platform, something like that. I was able to just do something a little simple here and just put some washers in and space the brackets out so that they would line up with the holes that are obviously in this mounting plate on the top that actually is the motion plate too. So that went pretty well actually. It was a little bit fiddly, but I managed to get it done without having to do any extra fabrication, which is always a good thing. Look under there, let me see it again. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. And yeah, now that we got the seat connected to the platform, all we gotta do is put some peripherals on here, a wheel, some pedals, and a shifter maybe, and then we can start testing this puppy out. Right, so let's go take a look at this application that runs this motion platform. But before I do that, I'm just gonna pop up this, let's see, where's my, there it is. The devices and printers in Windows 10 and show you that there is no next level racing motion platform up here. It is down here. It's called the HS-203, which is the model number that motion systems uses. And I was thinking, wow, okay, if I didn't go to motion systems website, I would not know that. But anyway, it'd be nice if it said something like next level racing on here or something like that. That way you could identify it right away. So if you had a problem with it, you could you know which one is the platform and then you could go to your properties and go through the usual troubleshooting processes that you might be using. Right. So anyway, just want to show you that real quick back to the application and it defaults to this window or view, if you will, called profiles. Now, these are the profiles of every single game that this motion platform currently supports under the current firmware that I have. And if you, you actually scroll down here, you see all the games represented here and some things that aren't games like this BU0836A interface, which is a Bodner USB interface that's on my HPP pedals. I'm using the ALOX shifter and Cube Control's GT wheel. So yeah, that's in there too. So all your devices show up apparently. And I've got some iRacing profiles in here that I've actually put in just for examples that we'll look at in a minute. So there's a lot of stuff supported here. And one of my favorites, Digital Combat Simulator, it supports all those, even including the 2.5 beta. Very, very nice. And yeah, I think if you have a game, this pretty much will support it. Now, I can also go to a different view, only installed, and that just shows the games that I have installed on your, my computer or your computer. You can go to my favorites, which I don't have any, because I haven't selected any. And I can go to only users. And what that is is the profiles. That'll show you the profiles you created and still showing us our devices up here, our USB devices. But these are just different profiles that I've created so far just to use in this example and just messing around a little bit so far. Right, so we'll go back to all. And then we're over on the right side here, we've got tools and diagnostics. And you can go here to devices and another window will pop up. Get up here so we can see it. And it shows the device, which is Motion Platform version 3.0a. It gives us our firmware, our status, work time, and all that stuff, uptime, so forth and so on. How many work days? Seven days have been messing with this so far. And there's a way to configure this, which is something you'll probably never have to do. It's got this thing called work envelope scaling, which I'm guessing that, you know, below, they quickly apply a limit motion platform work envelope, which I suppose will restrict the motion overall of, of this seat. So, yeah. The curious one here is level calibration. Now, it pops up a screen here, and 
it will actually go to like a default. And if yeah, I have it right now, current rear front balance, and then you got a left right balance. So if it's off kilter for some reason from the left to right, you can actually go in here and say left, and it will actually move left. And I'm going to do that. And I've, I've also got another camera <laughs> running to watch what happens. And I'm still sitting in it, so don't get alarmed when it moves because it says it will move, right? So make sure you're ready. And you just hit it, and it did a little left move, okay? And you can see the balance changed to 500. So now I'm, I can actually feel myself leaning left. And I can go back and hit right, and it goes back to zero. So we're incrementing in like units of 500, whatever that means either right or left. Now you can do the same thing for the rear or the left, or rather the front. And you can see I've already done that to 1000 and it's actually biased towards the rear. And what that allows you to do is actually change the, the angle of your seat as far as the rake without going in and changing your seat brackets. Now, it doesn't say anywhere that this has a detrimental effect to the performance of the seat, which I wouldn't imagine it would. It's just telling the software where your starting position is so it still knows how far it's still going to move you the same distance front or back for the heave and the surge and left and right for roll and things like that now you can always if you if you get lost and you get too out of kilter or whatever you can always just go right back to default and you saw it moved and it actually put me i feel i'm sitting further straight up now but i'm going to go back and hit hit it a couple times for the rear <laughs> you can see it moving me pretty good here and we're just going to leave it at that all right, because I haven't had any, any bad effects so far. Everything looks good. No overheating. <laughs> right, so there's some other stuff in tools and diagnostics also. Um, park it, which I suppose is you park it anytime you want. Center it. And that really didn't do anything either. And there's a platform trial mode. All right, so we also have software configuration, games integration, VR integration. And this is where we would set up our VR stuff. And I'll show you that screen my headset up here. If I had the headset, then I would actually, this is a compensation uh, information about user's head position relative to the top frame and improve the quality of compensation. So you measure these fields that these pictures show you here and I'll click on the picture. It's not a very good picture there, but they pop up another one. You can see it here. So this is just how to measure. And notice the platform they have here. It looks like one of those big six DOF platforms, you know, it's 56,000 euro numbers. Anyway, apparently the same measurements apply no matter what platform you're running. Right, so it shows you the, a, a better picture of it and where you get your measurements if you're setting it up. Allow for motion compensation in games. Yeah, of course you would want to do that if you are running a VR headset. Now it says Oculus DK2 Rift driver's not found because it's not on here. So you can install that. Steam VR, I do have that, but I could actually install that if I wanted to, but I, I'm waiting for my new uh, Samsung Odyssey Plus headset to come in before I do that kind of stuff. Anyway, so we'll just click OK. We're not going to do anything there. Uh, what's software configuration? This is just simply a, you know, what to display, what not to display. Enable force feedback plug-in experimental. Now I'm going to leave that alone because it's experimental, and usually when experimental that means you're just supposed to be playing with it, and that's just something we don't need to get into. Oops, I closed the whole thing. So if you hit that big X up there, apparently, okay, no, I didn't. I just, it, because I clicked that and closed it, it closed the app, but it actually opened up automatically again. Hmm. Anyway, so what else we got? Uh, kinematics, diagnostics, show tutorial. This is probably one that's it's a good one to look at. First off, it's got like these three pages of, you know, basic stuff here, action center stuff, action center I'll show you that in a second. And then it says close, but you can actually go over here also and go to the online user manual. And that pops up your browser, whatever your default browser is. And you can actually go scroll down. And that's a more involved manual for you to look at what's going on. Okay. So if you need that, then that's good to have there. So I actually close that out. And we'll close this too. And we're back to here. Debug graphs, that's if we were running some debugs. Tactile feedback configuration, that's if I was running the transducers and another sound card. You can select the device that is not your primary sound card. So if I had another sound card in here, I've got a speaker's Asus. It's funny it's not showing my Realtek audio card because that's on here too. Not sure why it's not showing that. Maybe if I hit enable the system. Now, I guess you gotta, you got to have a sound card to actually select, but that's my audio there. I'm not sure why it's not showing my real tech, but okay. 
anyway and this is where you would set things up on what you want as far as the outputs one two three mapping whatever outputs that your sound card is putting out to your transducers i don't have that set up here so we'll just go ahead and close that now uh debug graphs feedback diagnostic Let's see what that does well it does it's not going to pop up apparently because i don't have it update firmware this is where you update your firmware and you can see here that it is 87.3 and that's because i just updated it not too long ago so we don't need to update all right, we've also got some OB2, OBD2. Oh, wow, that's like car stuff that you run your diagnostics on a, a car. OBD2, that's funny. So they actually are using OBD2 PIDs, wow, for their information. That's pretty cool. Advanced users only, so we're not going to worry about that. And well, here we got a dashboard diagnostic. And this is a dashboard that you can actually put on your dashboard when you're running and it'll tell you a bunch of things here throttle percent all this stuff and you can actually this will actually drag and drop one too let's see if i was in another game i just drop it down to my three my triple monitor setup and you could see that now there's also another one called the g meter i'll bring that up here and you can actually drop that on too which will actually show you the g loading you're getting in the car very cool actually I uh, did not use this yet. I might actually just throw this up on the, when I'm doing the driving just to see what it looks like. So anyway, you can enable those two. Right. So enough of that. We've got games integration section, which I'm hitting here, and that pulls up the list of all the games that you can use. And it is a very, as you can see, a very long list of all the games that this motion thing supports. It just it's just very, very, very good as far as how many it supports. I'm really impressed by this. All right. Now, once we, you figure out which games that you supported, you can go buy your games and then play them. Uh, let's see. What else? Action Center. That is, again, this little thing here. Let's see. Can I? Yeah, there we go. Let me drag this up. It keeps opening up in my triples. There are no pending issues. Everything seems to be configured. Hey, great. That's super. Now, if it wasn't that way, we would have little thing saying to install a plug-in there's you know check this or check that whatever the case may be but it's just a diagnostics you know has discovered something and now they want you to do something take action if you will right vr integration let's see we pull that up oh, we already saw that I'm jumping around a little bit there global pause this actually pauses everything the motion in the seat the game it just pauses everything and i've never used that because i didn't need it Exit program, well, I'm not going to do that either. We need to use this program. Motion systems, you're getting powered by motion systems. Those are the manufacturers of this motion platform. And again, we see connected and running. Now, let me go to my, uh, let's see, only installed. And I'll go ahead and click on this. I think this will, let me go over here. Okay, there we go. Got rid of it. Got to click on tools and diagnostics again. Okay, so our racing. You can see I have it as a regular game installed, but you can also see I have these other things here, and it has a play icon. So if I want to run the game, I would simply click on it, but I'm going to go through this first. These are different profiles that I've done. Now, it's not intuitive how to save a profile here, and I did figure it out, obviously. And what you want to do, if you're getting into, let's say I've been driving a, a Corvette, a CR, C7R, 66R, whatever, in whatever track, whatever game, We'll, we'll just say iRacing, see how we're in that. And I'm going to move to the Mercedes or to a Ferrari or whatever else I'm going to use. It may be a different track too, depending. And what I would do first off is clone this one, right? So I would hit clone and it pops up saying, okay, activate new profile, open edit editor, so forth and so on. So what I would do is name this something different like I racing, you know, Corvette or Ferrari, whatever track. Then I would say OK. And once I did that, and open editor for new profile, I'm going to click that too. And it says it already exists, so I can't clone it. Well, anyway, that's how you do it. Now, whatever you named it, then you say OK, right? I'm going to cancel it. And then it would be the same thing, but it would be a different name up here. Instead of one, it'd be two and three, and I'll show you the changes I made on those. So it would still say, it would say two now. And then I can make all my changes to, for that car, for that track, for that game, right here. And then it would save it automatically. There's no really save place in here, right? And there's no default, you can't do a default thing. 
So yeah, that's it. So you go back, that gets you out of this profile, and there's the rest of my profile. So in two, I'll bring that one up, and you can see my overall intensity is set to 0 0.80. And then I would, you know, I could actually change that if I wanted to, or I could clone that one and start making changes to that clone. And, make cl and then I would name that clone three, and I'll bring that one up, and you see I've actually changed my intensity to 0.87. And the rest of the changes would still be there, too, for whatever they are. So that's how you save your profiles. Easy enough, I guess, once you figure, once you figure out how to manipulate the clone system. So we'll go back. And you can see I've got like four of them, and that was just for experimental. Let's go ahead and open four just for the heck of it. So you want to head on there? Okay. I had 0.75 on that one, and yeah, so that's about it for overall intensity adjustments, and I change that from time to time. Park on pause, that means if you pause it, then it pa it'll park wherever you're at on the track, and they'll park the seat in any configuration that it's in. So... Really, that's about it on the profiles and running through all the stuff here on the software. And what we'll do next is actually, obviously, get in a game and start running this. And we'll do some actual video of the seat moving from a couple of different angles. And I'll make some changes while I'm in the game. I'm pretty sure that works. And yeah, just take it from there. So anyway, we'll get to that next. All right, so here we are in iRacing. And we've got the profile screen open and I'm going to open the iRacing profile and that's going to give me the adjustable effects that are on iRacing. And you can see we have overall intensity, bumps, intensity, roll, heave, surge, sway, a thing called weight transfer bias, rev limiter threshold percent, and wheel lock intensity. So when the wheels lock up, you feel the vibrations. Now the rev limiter threshold percent, I'm gonna demonstrate that, something that I don't use because basically it sh really shakes the, the seat hard <laughs> when you hit the, uh, the the rev limit or the red line, which, you know, I do that by sound. I don't typically do that by, you know, my seat shaking or, or something beeping or something like that. So I just didn't see a use for it for me personally, but because if you put it, you can't really reduce it. If you put it at 50%, and yeah, if I run this up to like 50% or so, all that does is make it shake sooner. <laughs> so it's half, halfway up the rev limiter line, it would start shaking me. So yeah, that's something I'm not real keen on, but you know, everybody's different. Weight transfer bias, that's so we can make it go forward more, or it, it'll actually, if I'm accelerating, it'll dump me back in the seat. I can make a bias to make it m like, acceleration would be more force back to on the seat than going when I hit braking, the forward motion wouldn't be as intense. I usually just leave that alone. And you can see how I changed this. N another thing here, you can just click on it and it will zero out or go to the default setting with it happens to be 1.0 on the rest of these. And we'll see that in a second. And yeah, I just leave it at zero for now because it seems to be pretty even to me, but it's something else we can adjust. Sway intensity, that's gonna be our roll from left to right, swaying. And then we also have surge intensity, and that's the actual surge of like, you know, going forward, going backwards, the braking. That has something, re I believe, in relation to the weight transfer bias because, you know, it'll surge more front than it will back depending on where the bias is, or rather the bias is. Heave intensity. Well, heave intensity, that's like if you're going over bumps and things like that, the heave that you get from the actuators. Roll is, well, that's, we're back to roll now, so that's back and forth. And the same thing, it's kind of like sway, I would think. But sway kind of mixes in with roll, I believe. Bump intensity, well, it's just bump intensity. That's pretty much self-explanatory. Overall intensity is, well, overall intensity of all effects. And you can dial that. Once you have the effects dialed in, then you can use the overall effects to slow things or make things less than more or more. And if I click on this, the default for this is one. It centers back to one. I had it on 82. I try to get 80, but it goes to 78 and then it goes to 82 because unfortunately we can't adjust these numbers. You can't highlight it or anything and type in your own number, which would be nice because these sliders, it will go all the way up to 250, 2.5 rather, not 250. And it'll go all the way to zero, of course. And no matter where you are, it'll recenter. And all of these work the same, all these fields. And if I try to go down just to get 80, watch me get it now that I'm <laughs> on the video. Look at that, see, 80. <laughs> well, let's see if I can get 
80 on this. Well, see, see what I mean? It kind of, you got to be very careful how you move this. Like I said, oh, there was 80. Ah, I almost had it. But yeah, it's just too much fiddling and, you know, 1.80 or 0.81 versus 80. How much is that difference going to make? I don't know. But anyway, that's how we adjust our intensity. And you can adjust this live on the fly while you're actually driving. And we're going to do some driving. Let's go ahead and get into the cockpit. And I need to turn this down a bit. That's way too loud. It's going to drown me out. I know it already. So let me hop out real quick. Of course, I don't have my remote with me. It's on my other rig. And we'll turn that down because you guys aren't going to be able to hear me talk. And yeah, that just won't work. So let's go ahead. There we go. Now I got my trusted remote. All right. Here we go. Let me put a little bit on. Got to hear some noise. Can't drive with no motor, right? A little bit less than that. Let's see, jumps around. There we go, that's good enough. So, get that away. So now we'll go ahead and drive and what I'm looking for, first I'm gonna show you this rev intensity. That's something interesting. And you don't even have to go anywhere. So let's go down here to rev intensity threshold. I'm gonna go ahead and put that back to 100% where it is default and put it in gear and just start off here and watch what happens when I hit the red line for this thing. <laughs> yeah, it rattles you pretty good. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's great that it's there, I guess, if you can't see it red line, but it really shakes, shakes the crap out of you. <laughs> so I'm going to stop right away here, and we're going we're gonna to put that back down to zero. And, you know, it's great if you can't see your red line and, you know, you need something like that. But, and if I put it, I'll demonstrate that while I'm at it, why not? If I put it at 50, it's the strangest thing. Put it on 50 and I take off. It'll start popping at 50% throttle. If you're watching, if you can see my throttle line down here. So I'm about, well, let me get around this corner here. Okay. See, <laughs> I'm only at like three lights and it's, <laughs> it's doing it there. So yeah, I think I'm just going to turn the rev limiter off. So yeah, for me, I, I don't, it has it serves no purpose because you know I can see my my rev li lights up here, and plus, not only that, after a while you drive any car, you're going to be driving it off the sound of the car. You'll know when it's time to shift just by the you know the sound of the motor. At least you should be able to. So everything else is set at like 80 percent. You can see it. And another thing about this, this is a pretty quiet system. It's not that loud. And we'll just go down here and show you some of the sway. So it's, and of course, nothing to consider is I'm 150, 150 pounds. If somebody was like 200, you know, or over 200 pounds, they'll probably want more intensity in these settings because it's going to, you know, more weight is going to cause more dampening on the, the feel of the effects you're getting out of these motion systems. So that just makes sense. You would have a higher rating. And even at 82, and I believe less is more. I've learned that from my D-Box system. It's, yeah. You can see me going over some bumps there. It's just really doing a great job. It reminds me, obviously, of my Sim Experience rig. With the same kind of effects I'm getting. And it was a little, I'll, I'll, I have to admit, it was a little disconcerting at first because I'm used to the D-Box now and the whole chassis moves and now it's just the seat moving, the steering wheel's not moving, the pedals don't move obviously the only thing moving is the seat itself which is fine it's it was easy for me to adapt back to it and feel what the car is doing and catch slides and that's what motion's all about is to, to get you more involved or be more immersive as far as the simulator experience and there's no doubt it does that you can see me go over some front of the rough bumps here so yeah <laughs> This thing's fun, and it's quiet. I like the way it's quiet. It doesn't chirp like the SCN actuators is one of the things I, I noticed at first. And yeah, it's... 
and it really gives you a sense of the car slipping too. It, it has this cool effect that as the car slides, it kind of skips, so it, it kind of rattles you back, back and forth real quick, so you can feel the wheels, or the tires rather, actually skipping like they will do across the pavement when you're losing grip. So that's a great effect too. I really like that. In fact, the D-Box does that. D-Box does it a little better because it's the whole chassis, but yeah, this is... Yeah, I can feel a little bit there. It's not as good in iRacing as it is in Race Room or a set of Corsa as far as that sideways skipping motion. But yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying using this. And it's, this is such a nice compact unit that you can mount it to anything you want to. I mean, you have to do some fabrication, some bracketry and things like that. But, you know, that comes with making a, a rig anyway, I think, or building a rig. So we can actually go in here. And this is what I, what I did at first was turn everything on. I thought I would go in. Let's just go ahead and stop here. I thought I would go in and overall intensity here and to turn that down to zero. Or rather, leave it at 80. I'm going backwards. I regress here. Let's go to 80. Now, if I turn everything else off, I thought I would get, you know, put it down to zero and, well, let's leave bumps intensities to 80 and then turn everything else down to zero. All right, come on. Here we go. Close enough for testing purposes. Turn that off. Turn the sway intensity off. And wheel lock intensity. Go ahead and put that down to zero, too. And now we'll drive. And, of course, this is real time. As you change it, it will affect the carts right away, which is great, too, because we can make these adjustments as we're going down. Now, but the thing is, overall intensity doesn't do anything. I've got some bumps the seat's not moving anymore as you can see so I thought I would be able to just you know put it like on one intensity but and I would still get some effects but I'm gonna now I'm gonna stop and just go ahead and put this thing all the way up to 2.5 and see what that does and that might give me even with everything at zero no nope. so to feel any of the effects yeah you see nothing's happening so that's not working so we're gonna have to have Bump intensity, nothing's happening. So we're not going to have to have overall intensity is 80. Even with bumps intensity, I don't have anything there. It's like, it's, all I can think of is these effects are all intertwined with each other, if you will. So if you have them all off, you don't get anything. So if I put bump intensity, let's just go to default, makes it easy. And then I'm, I'm going to add roll and see if that does anything, if that adds any intensity at all. Actually, here, yeah, let's do that and see what happens. Even though I'm still at... Uh, 0.80 for overall intensity. Yeah, see, I'm still not getting anything. Now, what happens if I take overall intensity and put it all the way to 2.5? Just load it up. See how that affects anything. Now, remember, I do have bumps and roll at 1. I'm still not, well, I felt a little something there. Just a little something. So yeah, that's you know, the reason I'm doing this is because the whole idea was I could turn one thing on and see what it did and how it felt and get the level right for it and then go to the next thing and then turn it back off, you know, no, write down what it was, turn it back off, turn something else on, get the right effect or what, it, what that feels like and then turn that off and then go f so forth and so on down the list here. But that doesn't seem to be the case. So... Really, you're in to, to tune this, you're really kind of got to put everything up to one, except for rev limiter. I'll put wheel lock back on. And, and that's what I did at first, and then I just took, I'm definitely not going to have intensity up that high, and just, you know, put the intensity, let's just say 75, leave it at that. Now when I take off, I guarantee you we're going to be getting a lot of effects. So here we go. Yeah, so already we're... You feel the wheel bump as I was taking off. Now we're back to where we were before. And the shift intensity is not that much on this when you make a shift. I thought it would be more. And there, obviously, there's a way to make that more if you want it. But yeah, this feels... 
you can see coming around all those bumps that it's a heck of a, a turn there, Sea Ranch. That's why I like it so much. And we're coming down the bumpy straight here. So it lets you feel for sure what's going on. This is a bumpy turn here. Yeah. And it's pretty much matching what the car is doing up here also as far as the bumps and stuff like that. Let's go over some curbing here. Yep. Now, what it won't do, and this is, this is actually pretty good before I get to that. It feels good going over the, the bumps like that, going over the curbing. Let's go in the grass, drop one side off. Yeah, you can feel it, the seat's vibrating from that. The wheel more than the seat, actually. So, overall, I really like the sensation I'm getting from this seat mover. For a seat mover, it's very good, no doubt. Yeah. It really is involving. It makes you feel like a lot more like you're in the car than, if, of course, if you're sitting on a static seat. This really does a good job, especially for such a small, self-contained, all-in-one all unit. It's not very loud. It doesn't have the squeaking of my Sim Experience rig because of those SEN actuators. They just have that chirp. Not really a squeaking. It's more like a bird chirp to them. <laughs> yeah, this is... I like this. You know, I tell you, I could be happy just having this, no doubt. I am a little spoiled because I, I have a, a D-Box system, but hey, I was happy with my, my seat mover from Sim Experience, and I drove that for years. This is really nice. I like basically these settings all at one with my just changing the intensity. And that's one more thing we're going to do. Let me go back to intensity. Let's go back up here to the screen. And let me just turn that back up. Let's go to default to one. I'm sure that's going to increase it. So let's see what we got. Let's slip the clutch a little, get this thing going. I can feel the shift intensity has gone up. And the braking is really throwing me up against the pedals now. Yeah. Now it's getting intense. <laughs> this isn't really too bad. But you got to remember, the more motion you get, the less concentration you can have exactly on what your speed... You know, I, I tend to get slower the more immersion you get. It tends to slow you down for some reason. It's because I guess your body is getting all these different things going on. Let's go through the whoopties here. <laughs> then we'll go down the bumpy straight. <laughs> this is actually doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like this. <laughs> oh. Okay. Wow, that's easy to catch. I, I caught that pretty easily. And that's another th great thing about these seat movers or the immersion of a, of a simulation that's motion that's moving is it lets you know what the car is doing along with your wheel, of course, pretty quickly and it's easy to, easier to correct for slides and things like that. <laughs> See, I was able to catch pretty good because the, the seat was telling me what was going on and what I should be doing. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's a quick test and a little overview of what the software is capable of as far as your heave, your yaw, surge, and changing all these things around. And I, I wish that you could actually turn everything off and just turn one on and then, and then be able to feel exactly what was happening with that one uh, as far as effect. Yeah, that one effect. That's what I'm trying to say, effect. Yeah, that would be nice if you could do that and then turn that off and so forth. You can do that in some experience on theirs, I know, because I did it all the time. And, yeah, it's. I just wish that we could do that. But other than that, it's fine. And this rev limiter threshold thing, I'm not crazy about that. But, again, this is totally subjective, every bit of this. You know, just because I like something or don't like something certainly doesn't mean someone isn't going to like it or will like what I like. So... And that, it's just one of those things when it comes to simulations in general. So, yeah, I really like this so far. I'm, I'm really 
happy with what this thing is doing. It's, it's really doing a great job here of relaying the motion. And for the price point and the, the size, you know, the, like I said before, how small this is in a self-contained unit, the only issue is mounting it to your rig, which can be easy if you get lucky, or it can be, you know, you making a, some brackets up and having to get something fabricated to get it to mount. Or, you know, th there's always some way to get it done, though. And because the way this thing is designed, I think it's not that hard. It's just the, the fabrication to get it to fit your rig. I was lucky on this rig, the way it, it fit in here. Right. So what I'm going to do now is just I'm going to do some running eye racing. I'm going to go to Project Cars uh, 2. I'm going to do some Assetta Corsa and probably some Race Room. And, yeah, just see how those things run. I'll just shoot some video of that and make some comments on that as I'm actually using those games. We'll get to that segment next. All right, so here we are in iRacing and Ferrari 488 to start it off as far as the driving impressions. And you can see through the corner here that this seat is definitely moving me around. And you can feel every little bump in and down the straight. The same thing, it's kind of a bumpy straight here. You can see it kind of pushing me there when we hit the bumps there. And yeah, this corner coming up, uh, turn one here is, is very bumpy too. A lot of people don't realize that, but it, yeah, this seat demonstrates that quite well. And yeah, this, this feels like a seat mover, should feel like. And you know, in heavy braking, it pushes you up against the steering wheel and your pedal set. And yeah, it does a great job. It's just, you know, I'm really impressed with this small package and what it's really putting out here. And for those of you who are interested in the config that I end up running, here's a picture of it. And, you know, you can stop the video and, and check that out. But everybody likes different things. But I did turn it down from what you see here. This was actually on one for everything and that's just so i could get a feel for the power of the system and it's got plenty of power i'm 150 pounds and now we're over in a set of course of two 150 pounds and so that's why i turned them down the settings that you saw and you'll see the same thing when i show you the settings in here in a set of corsa because you know somebody weighs like 200 pounds or more would probably want more in it than what i had so yeah it's, it's, again, a subjective thing anyway, but I would think somebody heavier would want a little bit more movement from what I have turned them down to in the games that you see coming through the sequence ahead of us. So, yeah, set of course have worked great, just like it did in iRacing, no problems, no hiccups. It's just one of those things that's a joy to use because the thing just works, and right out of the box. It's just a matter of really dialing in what you feel is a good feel for you. And here's the a set of course of settings. And coming up to the corkscrew here, you can see it throws you up against the wheel again for the heavy brake, and I'm leaning left, I'm leaning right. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> so next up, I believe, is, this is Race Room. Yes, Race Room. One of my, getting to be one of my favorite games, actually. Anyway, does a great job here. Watch this corner coming up. You see that shaking right there? That's the wheel hop of when you're sliding, your wheels feel like they're hopping, like they do in real life. If you're in a rear wheel drive car and even a front wheel drive car, if it's going across bumps in a corner when you're sliding and you can feel the pop, 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 and that's what that was. It's a very cool sensation. Actually, my D Box simulator does the same thing to give you this, the feeling of slipping. Anyway, so yeah, the settings here were pretty much close to what I had when I was running the other games too. And you can see right there, there's a little shot. So yeah. Again, it's doing a great job in this game. Just it's, talk about plug and play. It just never did, had a hiccup here. Maybe I did when I kind of bumped this guy. He just wouldn't get out of my way. But anyway, last one's going to be, where are we at? Oh, Project Cars 2, yes. So this is Project Cars 2, and again, just plug and play. You know, it's you can leave it all on one and just go, and it just works right out of the box, just like a champ. And yeah, I have to say that I was ple pleasantly surprised because I'd seen videos of this before on YouTube and online places and I just wasn't sure about it. Such a small unit with just the two actuators running on two motors moving you around. And, but yeah, it, it really is the real deal here as far as a seat mover. There's you know, no compromise in the motion here. Got my settings here. You can see for there what I was using. And again, lower than the, the, the 1.0 it comes to fault. So overall experience, really great. You know, they really, I think they got a winner here with this package. It's so compact, you can mount it anywhere. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to the final thoughts.
Final thoughts on the V3 motion platform from Next Level Racing. If you ever want a good example of good things come in small packages, the V3 motion platform would be it. When I first saw the V3, I didn't think something this compact would be able to deliver the kind of g-forces that the big SEM platforms could. In use, I could see right away that I was wrong. The V3 is a very powerful system. Even at the default 1.00 level settings, it can give you a good shaking. I think only the heaviest racers would need to push the slider to the upper reaches of its limits. In fact, I found myself turning down all the sliders to get what I thought would be the proper g-force cues for the car I was using. Of course, the amount of force that you like when driving a motion simulator is a very subjective thing, and others might feel differently. You can tell right away that the construction of the V3 motion platform is top flight all the way through. Not that surprising after I learned that this unit is made by motion systems who are based in Poland. And they make some very serious motion platforms, all the way up to the 56,000 euro, 6 DOF, 2,500 kilogram load capable PS6TM 2,500 motion units. <laughs> so the V3 is sporting some great family lineage here, and it shows. The internals are very tidy. The two servo motors are attached to their respective planetary gear drives that deliver the goods when it comes to power while still delivering the finesse required to convince the users as much as a two-axis seat mover can that they are driving a real race car. All this in a very compact package, which lends itself to be installed where other seat mover solutions may present some problems. I did some looking around and found the V3 for sale at the lowest price of $2,800 shipped. Not an inexpensive item, but one that would be easier for me to justify than some of the other things I've bought over the years to feed my sim racing habit. Overall, I would have to say I am impressed with the next level racing V3 motion platform. One of those things that just delivers the goods. <laughs> I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, and if you would like to support what we do here at the SRG, visit our website at simracinggarage.com.